Hi, hello everybody. Uh, I hope that you are enjoying the Congress and uh, I hope that you en enjoy my presentation. Uh, for the next uh, 45, 50 minutes, I will talk about uh, hardware attacks, hardware security. Uh, more specific, I will talk about uh, fall injection. And I will talk from my uh, experience as professional evaluator that has been uh, using fall injection and other hardware techniques for testing products. So uh, maybe you don't know what is fall injection. So the first thing I will do is uh, make a short introduction to fall, to, to fall injection. Then I will talk about uh, real attacks on the real world, uh, products that have been hacked. And then I will introduce some of the techniques or some of the tests we do uh, on the products we evaluate. And finally, I will talk about uh, protections, how to prevent these kind of attacks. So. Let's start with this. Let's take a look at this code. This is a code uh, I took from uh, somewhere, from a product. Um, it's kind of the, the code I found. This code authenticates a PIN or a password. If you take a look, uh, there is three software vulnerabilities, three problems. So an attacker can bypass the PIN check or the PIN authentication uh, in three different ways. So first, here in red, I mark um, there is a problem with this loop that iterates through the password, through the pin. This loop only iterates as many bytes as the user provides. So if the user provides one single byte as password of pin, uh, only one byte will be checked. Then here, there is a buffer overflow. Uh, the software does not check how many bytes you provide as a pin. So the buffer can be overflowed, and the uh, attacker can get runtime control of the target. And finally, we have a format a stream vulnerability. So all these three attacks are very common, are very uh, well known, uh, and they are very easy to fix. So uh, this could be a possible solution. In blue, uh, there is the changes that could fix this, this software. So we fix the loop. Uh, we put a limit to the number of uh, bytes we get as a, as a password or as a pin. And finally, we format properly the string. So is this now secure? Well, from the software point of view, uh, probably it is. I don't find a way that uh, you can attack this code from the software point of view. I think that all the issues are fixed. But <coughs> if the attacker has physical access to the device that is running this software, if he can use get this uh, device, because this is running on a smart card or on a IoT or embedded, any kind of embedded device and has access to it, then the attacker can try uh, hardware attacks. And um, I will talk today about uh, one hardware attack, which is fall injection. And this code has at least uh, four places where you can inject uh, a fault and you can bypass this, uh, this check. So in red here, 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 and here. So uh, I will explain what is wrong with these sentences and why you can bypass uh, the check uh, here. But before that, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Ramiro, uh, and I am a, a technical lead at Risk Your Security Lab in China. So I work actually here in China. We have a security lab here in China, in Shanghai. And my company specializes in hardware evaluations. We evaluate uh, chips, uh, we evaluate uh, uh, SOCs, uh, embedded system, IoT devices, automotive, uh, mostly hardware, sometimes some software also. And we also do uh, hardware. We develop hardware for testing the security, hardware security. Okay, so let's talk about fall injection, how this works. So if we check the documentation of a chip, if uh, we have a chip that uh, has been used to develop uh, a device, if we check the documentation of this chip, there will be probably something like this. Uh, in the data sheet or in the manual, we will find a plot like this, uh, which indicates what is the safe area, what is the voltage you can uh, use to, to power this chip. Uh, sometimes it's a plot like this, sometimes it's a, um, a table, but the manufacturer tells that this chip can operate between 1.8 volts and 
5.5. But what happens here in this area in, re in red? So if we try to op power the chip with one below 1.8 volts or 5.5, what happens? Manufacturers will not tell you. They will only say that the behavior is undefined. So what actually is happening? Okay, so it's, it's obvious that if um, we power the device at five point f uh, above the specifications for uh, some time, uh, we will hit the chip and we will kill it, we will burn. In the same way, if we operate the chip under voltage for some time, we will uh, put the chip to, we will switch it off, we will put it to sleep. It will not be power, so it will not work. But the question is, what happens when the chip is uh, going beyond the specifications for a very short period of time? So for a just few nanoseconds or few microseconds, we exceed the voltage limits uh, above or below. So this is what we call a glitch. And this glitch might introduce uh, faults in the chip and an attacker, by doing these glitches, the attacker can get uh, some benefits of the chip. So let's see uh, what happened inside the chip. So this is my CPU, this is a chip. It's powered uh, with external power supply. Uh, this CPU is composed of uh, different modules. It has a arithmetical logical unit, it has a control unit, SRAM, CAS, and all these modules are uh, powered using um, a power distribution network. Inside the chip, there is a, a network that powers the different uh, circuitry. Uh, if we look at this distribution, this power distribution, uh, some modules are closer to the power pin, some modules are farther, so some power lines are longer and some are, are shorter. So this power line, for example, is very close to the pin where the power, uh, where the chip is powered. So the power distribution line is very short. And the control unit is powered with a long power line because uh, yeah, it's farther from the pin. And uh, because it's longer, the resistance, when the currents flow through this line, the resistance uh, will be higher. So the different modules will have different length in the power line that distribute the power. And uh, these different modules have different capacitance. This resistance and this capacitance uh, creates filters. So when I inject a glitch, this glitch, not all the modules inside the chip will see the same way. Depending the shape of the glitch, how long is the glitch and how deep is the glitch, or what is the shape, uh, some modules will, or some circuits will filter the glitch and so there, some others will not. So in this example, I have here uh, the arithmetical logic unit, because it's very close to the power pin, the resistance of the power distribution line is very small, uh, the filter is very small, so the glitch, if an attacker injects a glitch, it will be affected. But the control unit will not, because it's farther and it's filtering the power better. So an attacker, by injecting different glitches with different shapes, can affect different modules uh, inside the chip. And what exactly he can get when he injects the glitches? Okay, so we have these effects. An attacker can get the following. So the first is that he can disable the modules. So we saw before, here, during the period of time that the glitch, uh, that we are glitching the, the, the device, the chip, during that period of time, the arithmetical logic unit is under power, so it's not going to work, while the rest of the chip is working normally. And after the glitch, everything works and operates normally. So uh, an attacker can try to inject glitches, hoping that a hardware security uh, module or feature in the chip will uh, stop to work during this small period of time that the glitch uh, takes place. But something that uh, an attacker can also expect when inject glitches is flipping bits. Flipping bits a story inside the chip, on the memory of the chip. So this is a flip-flop. 
this circuit is the standard uh, memory cell. This is the basic unit that stores information inside a digital circuit. So any SRAM, any register in a CPU is uh, composed of many of these uh, flip-flops in series. Uh, yeah, it can store only one single bit. So here, this flip-flop is storing one, is storing one bit, and the value is one, is what we see in the queue output of the, in the top right. So if an attacker injects a, uh, a glitch, and this glitch uh, makes the the power of the of the of the gates of the flip flop uh, to go lower than the threshold level, the voltage threshold level for the decision of whether uh, the gate is getting a one or getting when it's getting a zero. The NOR gate will see instead of a one in this place will see a zero, and this zero will be propagated through the flip flop. Then, when the voltage, uh, when the glitch is uh, over, and the voltage gets normal, we uh, the flip flop we remains or will uh, keep the value of the the value the flipped value of the of the uh, will keep the value we flip. So, using a glitch, we manage to change the content of a memory cell from one to zero. But we can do the same to flip from zero to one. So it operates uh, in the same way. So what else can we get with glitches? So with glitches, we can also corrupt uh, the code that is being executed in the, in the CPU. So this is the code I showed you at the beginning. And I told you that here, the red line uh, is a place I can inject a fault. I can use glitching to bypass the secure uh, check, the, the pin check. So why this happens? If we take this sentence in C and we compile uh, in ARM, for example, we have this assembly code. These three instructions do the same that we have here in C. If we look at uh, how the branch, the assembly uh, instruction for the branch, the, the branch is encoded. If we look at this, this is how the branch is encoded because we have a tool which is the glitches. We can use the glitches to flip bits. If we use a glitch and this glitch happens to flip one of the bits in the instruction that is being executed, the CPU will execute the instruction in a different way. So in this example here, if we flip the first bit, from one to zero, I will not execute a branch. I will be ex executing a, a store uh, instruction instead. So my code changes completely. Here in the top left, you can see what is the actual code I'm executing. So with one glitch, I can change the flow of the code. I can change how the code is executed. Another example, the next uh, instruction in assembly, the store uh, is encoded like this. If we glitch up uh, and we change one of the bits from one to zero, the instruction is executed in a completely different way. And again, we change the, the, the flow, or we change the code, how it's executed, uh, we change the software that the chip is executing. So an attacker can inject glitches, hoping that he will flip the bits that he needs in order to change the software in the way he is looking for, to skip instructions or to corrupt instructions or to do whatever he wants. What else? Uh, an attacker, yeah, when he's trying to uh, inject glitches, sometimes because we are putting the chip uh, above or under uh, the recommended voltage, sometimes uh, we can destroy the chip. This is uh, something we, as an attacker, we don't want, but sometimes we will kill the chips, we will kill the, the CPU. But this doesn't happen too often, to be honest. Okay, so this might be a, a bit strange for you, uh, that you can use voltage uh, glitches to just chain uh, the code that is being executed and bypass security uh, protections in, in a hardware device. 
uh, it sounds strange, but the truth is that this has been used for many, many, many years already. Uh, and there is many things that have been hacked using poly injection. And now because we have uh, all these new IoT devices and because the security, the software security is being increased, uh, many hackers found out that nowadays it's easier to hack an IoT device or a embedded device. It's easier to hack using hardware techniques than using uh, software techniques or software attacks. Uh, so for that reason nowadays, basically almost every few months, we see a new attack, uh, somebody that is doing something with poly injection and is getting some results. So I took this from Twitter a few weeks ago, somebody was publishing, he managed to break uh, embed TLS using poly injection. A couple of years ago in DEFCOM, uh, there was somebody who was uh, presenting how to bypass the authentication of a Trezor, a Bitcoin wallet using poly injection. And video game or arcade machine, but um, 30 years ago, uh, kids were using these lighters that uh, have a spark, a spark lighters, that uh, when you press the button there is a spark. So they were using this spark to shock the arcade machine or the video game machine and play for free. And this was 30 years ago, and this was a way of doing full injection or glitching and kids uh, were doing this even without knowing it. Funny thing is that uh, still nowadays, 30 years later, this is a very common attack. I found this video on the internet. This is a guy who sells this device. This is a device who makes a uh, full injection. It's doing glitching, not with voltage, but with EMP, electromagnetic pulses. So this small device generates electromagnetic pulse, and this pulse generates a glitch. So he's putting this device close to the electronics that counts the coins. And you can see here uh, the counter that counts how many coins you insert in the slot machine. And it's increasing as long as he's pressing the button to glitch. And he can play. So he can just play and try to get the, the price of the machine. So this is an example, another example of uh, real world uh, full injection attack. Okay, so uh, these attacks have been uh, there for long and uh, some industries know this. So some industries like smart cards have been tested against full injection for many years already. And uh, I have been uh, doing this, uh, testing against full injection for quite long time now. So I will explain some different tests or different uh, attacks we do on real products, uh, on real products that we evaluate for customers. So before going through these examples, uh, I want to introduce you the first rule of poly injection, which is uh, everything can be hacked with poly injection unless that you protect against these kind of attacks. And uh, the second rule is that even if you protect your product against poly injection, it might be hacked because poly injection is really difficult to prevent. And there are many ways that it can be used to attack a, a product. So let me show you some examples. I chose uh, five different examples of a uh, test we do on real products uh, where we use poly injection to try to bypass some kind of security. So the first one is bypassing authentication. This is what I explained before here. Uh, this pin authentication. Uh, I have some demos. I brought with me some tools. So if you are interested to see this on real life, I have uh, my tools in the in my bag. 
Uh, I wanted to do some demos, but it's very hard to do demos here. Uh, so I make a video yesterday of this. This is the tool we use for injecting glitches. So the green uh, board, uh, the small green board, is an ARM uh, processor. It's just a, a small embedded device with an, an ARM chip. And the green box, the green yellow box, well, the yellow box, the big yellow box, is the tool we use to inject glitches. So this tool uh, powers the, the CPU and uh, you program it in such a way that you inject a glitch when you want. So I made a program that uh, is trying to bypass authentication of this code I saw you here. So what this program is doing is uh, sending, waiting for the, for the chip to send you the message, insert a pin, sending zero, zero, zero as a pin, in that moment injecting a glitch, and reading the response. If the glitch succeeds to bypass authentication, then I will have a pin correct. If not, I will have a pin incorrect, right? Sometimes I will have a response which is uh, random garbage because sometimes the chip crashes. So this is the operation of this uh, attack. I, I made a video yesterday. So most of the times we see that the pin is incorrect because we don't succeed on glitching properly. And from time to time, this will be a pin correct. Here, there it is. So this was one attempt. We have to try many times until one of the glitches affect the chip in such a way that bypass the software the way we look or we are looking for. And sometimes these um, lines, which are empty, uh, is because we crash the chip, because probably the software crashes or jumps somewhere, I don't know. Uh, this kind of test, trying to bypass authentication schemes, uh, we use this uh, a lot of uh, smart cards. Basically, there is no uh, smart card nowadays on the market uh, that has not been tested against this kind of poly injection attacks. We also test this uh, a lot in the smart meters. Uh, smart meters, they have a debug interface, so an operator can physically go to the meter and debug it. And there is an authentication uh, protocol to, to, to be able to debug the, the smart meter. Uh, we recently tested a couple of uh, Bitcoin wallets and password wallets. Um, basically, any kind of device with some kind of uh, Linux, normally with Linux you have a, a UART uh, port with there is some kind of shell and you have to, uh, you need to know the password to go in, you can bypass quickly using full injection. And also automotive. Yeah, uh, it might be not trivial why or where there is some authentication scheme in a car. We use full injection to bypass UDS. UDS is a protocol, a diagnosis protocol that is implemented in most of the cars in the market or most of the new cars. This protocol allows uh, to uh, get logs from the car, get uh, yeah, do some diagnostics on the, on the car. So if something is failing, you can use this protocol to see what is failing. And one of the features of this protocol is that you can extract the firmware and you can change the firmware. You can unload a new firmware. So this is very interesting from the hacker point of view is you can recover the firmware and then you can chain and put a backdoor or something like that. So how this, uh, well, um, to prevent hackers to access to this protocol and get the firmware and modify the firmware, there is some kind of authentication scheme. This authentication is just basically a challenge response. Uh, the car sends a random number. The random number is encrypted with a, a secret password. Uh, the response is sent to the car, and if the response is correct, the car allows you to debug using this protocol. So we can use full injection in the car or in the ECU, which is the computer of the car, to bypass uh, this, uh, this check. So probably there will be a code like this one, where we, we check if the key uh, that we receive is the correct one. If not, we just jump to a place that probably will reset the car or will just ignore the authentication. Uh, so we can just use a glitch to corrupt these instructions in such a way that they are not executed. Okay, uh, what else we can do? 
we test a lot of secure boots. <laughs> so secure boots, probably you know, is a security features uh, security feature that uh, is implemented in many SOCs and many CPUs and many devices to be sure that only uh, software that has been signed and has been authorized is running on the on the device on the on the CPU. So um, normally this is a ROM code that is in the chip that at boot time authenticates, uh, calculates the signature, and authenticates the signature of the firmware, the software that is uh, stored in the flash before loading into the RAM and executing the code. And normally there is a chain, so there is like different phases, different stages, where we are authenticating different parts of the firmware. Uh, this is used a lot in uh, smartphones to prevent anybody to just uh, put any firmware or custom ROM in, in, uh, in the phone, especially if your phone supports TE. And we test a lot of this. We test a lot of uh, secure boots in uh, phones uh, to check if they are secure. We also test a lot of uh, pay TV systems or smart TVs. And uh, basically, Almost nowadays, almost any IoT device or embedded device have this secure boot. Uh, so routers or cameras, whatever. Almost every device have one of these secure boots, and uh, we test them to be sure that nobody can use Fall Injection to bypass them. How can you bypass a secure boot with Fall Injection? Well, if we have a tool that allows us to skip instructions or to corrupt instructions, then it's very easy to do it. Whenever there is uh, well, when the secure boot is checking the signature uh, of the next stage, we can just inject a glitch and prevent the execution of that check and bypassing it. So this is a code of a simple uh, secure boot uh, that loads the plus image and then uh, calculate the hash, uh, check the signature, and then uh, compare the hashes and the signature. So here in this code, we can inject the glitches in many different places. So like uh, here, or here, here. So all these red lines are different places that we can easily inject a glitch and bypass the secure boot. But the problem here is that a secure boot is kind of complex, and there are many, many, many ways to bypass it. There is many instructions that when we corrupt them, we can just uh, skip the secure boot and bypass it. Uh, and this is something that is uh, very complicated to protect. So uh, I was introducing before the second rule of fall injection, which is that when you protect, you want to protect your uh, device against fall injection, you try to do your best, and sometimes you fail because it's very hard to, to protect it. Uh, when we we have many customers that try to protect the secure boots against fall injection, and uh, they find the most obvious places uh, where we can inject glitches, and they protect these places. But then we test the product, and we find that there are many different places uh, that they didn't consider that you can inject uh, a glitch and bypass the secure boots. And it's sometimes it's not obvious. So we develop a tool. We develop this tool, which we call fall injection simulator, that simulates all the possible glitches uh, on the code and it tells you which ones will allow you to bypass the secure boot. So this tool is this one here. We load the secure boot or any code we want to test and then we'll compile for the platform that uh, this test is going to, this, this code is going to be running, ARM normally, and then we can just press the button simulate and it will try to, it will compile the code and will try to simulate all the possible glitches on all the instructions of the code. After running the simulation, well, it will take some time to, to find all the glitches in the res right side. Uh, here in the right side, we have the different glitches that the tool finds. It takes around five minutes to, to do this. It depends, of course, of the size of the code. And then at the end, we have a list of all the possible glitches. Uh, this is our instructions, assembly instructions, that if you inject a glitch and you flip one single bit, will allow you to bypass the secure boot. 
So with this tool, we can easily identify potential vulnerabilities in the code and uh, try to mitigate those, those uh, vulnerabilities. I have this tool here in my computer. If you want to see how it works, just let me know. I will be around so I can just show you the tool. So more attacks w we test. Uh, we test uh, escalation of privileges. So quite often we are in the situation that we have a product, we have a device, and we have only restricted access to this product. And we want to break out of this restricted access and uh, be able to execute uh, or well, get full control of the box. So this happens in many scenarios, but the most two common ones are when we have a user space control and we want to break into kernel space or we have REE control and we want to break and get control of the TE. So just to put an example, uh, breaking uh, the TE, there is a technique we use a lot. We call this a wild jump attack. Uh, I will explain how it works. This is a, a TE system. This is a the memory segmentation of, on a TE system. The REE can only access to the RE memory and the T can only access to the T memory. There is a shared memory, which is the mailbox. So when the RE wants to send a, a message to the T, uh, this is done through the mailbox. Put the message in the mailbox and the T will read it and the other way, the other way around. So this attack works as follows. The RE, who is on under control of the attacker, because maybe the attacker has can, can run an application on the RE, the attacker uh, puts a payload, a malicious payload, on the message box. This is the payload that uh, he wants the TE to, to run. And then he sprites the memory with the payload address. He sprites uh, the, the rest of the, ma the mailbox and indicates the TE that there is a message, message to read. The TE will read this message normally using a main copy or some kind of similar function. And this main copy, what normally does is load uh, from an, uh, uh, an address, copy into a register, and then from the register to a different address. So if the attacker injects a glitch when the uh, address of the payload is being copied, and this glitch happens to affect the load instruction, this load instruction is encoded like this, if the glitch happens to chain few bits like this, what we have is that we copy the payload address directly into the program counter, into the PC. So we are basically forcing the CPU of the TE to run our payload. And then the attacker gets uh, full control of the, pay of, the, of the TE. And we can do exactly the same for breaking from the user space uh, to a kernel space. Uh, we use this kind of attacks, yeah, as, as in the, all these devices I mentioned before, in phones, normally in phones uh, where there is a TE and we want to test if we can uh, break the TE to access to the secrets of banking applications, of payment, payment applications. Uh, we use this with uh, Linux systems, uh, Linux uh, products, and we use this in Android phones or devices to see if it's possible to root these devices. And we do this a lot on any kind of device that implements uh, ARM Thruston TE. Okay, uh, something else we test. We try to recover crypto keys using full injection. This is quite complex. Uh, there are many different ways of doing this, and uh, there are many techniques, there are many papers published out there that explains how using full injection you can get keys from a, a system. So I will not go through this full analysis. This is called full analysis. I will not go through this because it's very complex. Uh, this basically uh, is based on uh, injecting a glitch on the internal state of the of the cryptographic uh, algorithm in such a way that uh, this glitch affects uh, the internal state and by analyzing how the, the glitch uh, or how the error that you introduce is propagated, you can try to recover the key. This is very complex. I will not talk about this. I will talk about something simpler. 
which is that many devices that uh, works or operate uh, with uh, crypto cryptographic, uh, yeah, many devices that have crypto engines, uh, they normally have a key slot. This key slot is a place in the memory or a region or registers that uh, stores all the keys. And these keys goes to the crypto engine. And normally these keys in the key slot, there are attributes. These attributes indicate which key can be used with which algorithm. So for example here, we have uh, the key number one can only be used with AES because in the attributes, it says that it's only possible to use with AES. If somebody tries uh, to tell the crypto engine to use the key number one with a uh, DES, uh, it will be, it will not work. The engine will not accept the operation because uh, the key has no permissions to be used with this. So here we can use full injection to change this attribute table in such a way that we allow operations that uh, we were not supposed to do. So now we, for example, in this case, we change the key number one so we can use with this. Why we want to do this? because this is very easy, this is very easy to break. We can brute force this. So if we can use full injection to force a key to go into the this engine, we can then use brute force to recover this key. Uh, we use this uh, in all the devices I mentioned before, plus white box crypto. Uh, white, white box crypto is a kind of obfuscation technology or kind of DRM technology, it's not the same, but kind of DRM technology, is a way to obfuscate uh, the crypto operations. And we use uh, this full injection to recover the keys from this uh, white box crypto. Um, finally, my final attack or final example, uh, modifying security configuration. So if a chip or a system has security features, those features have to be initialized at some point. Normally this happens during the secure boot or this happens at boot time. There is a software that enables the security features, like for example, enables the uh, blocks the JITAG or enables the memory scrambling or uh, I don't know, whatever. So this normally happens at boot time. So because we saw how glitches can be used to bypass instructions or to corrupt instructions, we can use glitches to prevent the initialization uh, of these security features. But there is something else we can do. After the system is in initialized, uh, after the system is running and the security features are initialized, there will be somewhere in the chip one bit that indicates that the security feature is enabled. So if we can inject a glitch and chain that bit from one to zero, we can disable this feature and we can do this glitching. The thing is that if we inject voltage glitches, if we use voltage glitching to try to flip this bit, uh, we will need to try a lot of times before glitching the specific byte, or sorry, the specific bit we are looking for. So there is a different technique. We can use what we call localized fall injections. This is a tool that allows you to um, inject a glitch in a specific part of the chip. So uh, if you know where is this bit uh, that you want to flip located in the chip, you just with this tool, you can just flip only that bit. So we use uh, electromagnetic fall injection, electromagnetic pulses, like the video of the slot machine I showed you before, only that we have more precision because it's a proper tool. And we also use lasers. We use the laser to hit the surface of the chip and the photons will, uh, will uh, open or close transistors, uh, making the, the, the bits to flip from one to zero, from zero to one. This video shows uh, how we use lasers to, to test uh, a chip. So this chip is, a, a, again, an ARM, ARM processor. Uh, you can see here a blinking lights. This is actually the laser. We are shooting with the laser on the surface of the chip. So what we are doing is we want to disable a feature we know there is a bit somewhere that disable this feature. So what we are doing is inject a laser, uh, inject with the laser a, a pulse, try to see if the feature is disabled. If not, we go to the right. 
we move the laser a bit to the right and we inject a glitch again. And we try and try and try until we find which is the place that uh, when we inject a glitch uh, with the laser, we flip the bit we are looking for. Uh, this is a setup of a EM fall injection. Here we are using a EM uh, transient probe to do the same uh, on a board. Okay, and I have been talking about fall injection, uh, about attacking. I'm going to talk now about preventing. Uh, so, if we want to protect our products against fall injection, we can uh, choose hardware protections or software protections. Which one is better? The thing is that rule number three, if you want to protect your product, you have to use both hardware and software countermeasures. Uh, the thing is, the problem is that most of the times we are just using a third party uh, chip. We are using a chip from somebody else. We don't have control on the hardware, so we cannot make changes on the chip to protect the, chi the chip against fall injection. So we have to use only software countermeasures. S still, uh, it will not be perfect. If you use only software countermeasures or protections, it will not be perfect, but it will improve the security of your product really a lot, really. So if we use hardware countermeasures, normally what we use is uh, we put in the chip, we put git sensors. Uh, we put sensors that detect when the voltage is going low, low, uh, down or up very fast. And if we detect this glitch, we can just reset the chip. Or we can add redundancy. So we want to protect a bit that we know that uh, so an attacker wants to flip it because it's a bit that enables or disables uh, security features. Uh, we can add extra bits to protect this, uh, this bit. We can add parity bits. So if somebody flips this bit, the parity will detect the flip and then the chip will, uh, well, you can reset the chip if you detect that there is a glitch, a, a parity mismatch. Uh, software countermeasures, we can use, um, okay, we can use many techniques to protect your software. Uh, I am going to mention the most useful and simplest ones, and if you use this, you can improve a lot the security of your system. So this is the code I have before, and with a simple glitch, or one single glitch, we can bypass uh, this authentication. So how to prevent this? We copy-paste the code twice. So we put the code twice, so the attacker can glitch the first time, but the same condition will be checked later, so the attacker, if he managed to glitch the first time, the second time that has your, uh, your product check the condition, will find. So we can copy paste the, the checks. Of course, the attacker can do a double glitching. He can glitch twice, but this is much more complicated than a single glitch. Okay, here, if we just manage to glitch the first time, the second time that we check will detect the glitch. Okay, uh, something else we can do is uh, software countermeasures. Uh, something else we can do is uh, adding random delays. The idea is that the attacker needs to inject the glitch when the instruction that he wants to corrupt uh, is being executed. So if we add a random delay uh, before this place that we want to protect, the attacker will not know when this instruction is going to be executed. So he will not be able to inject the glitch. So this is a very effective way to prevent glitches. There are many more. Uh, there are many more. I have a link at the end that you can see uh, more techniques to protect your code. Okay, and to finish as conclusion, I will conclude uh, with these three rules. Uh, everything can be hacked. Any hardware can be hacked if you have physical access to it as long as you don't protect this hardware against fall injection. So you can put a lot of security in your device. You can do many uh, reviews of your code. You can do many penetration testing, uh, trying to find vulnerabilities in the code, software vulnerabilities. But then a hacker can get your device physically and use one of these hacking techniques and bypass everything very easily. So you should also make an effort to protect your hardware 
against this kind of hardware uh, hacking techniques. Uh, the second rule that is even if you protect uh, against full injection your product, you have to keep in mind that it's very hard to do it and uh, still you might be hacked. And finally, remember that if you want to protect your product, you should always use hardware and software countermeasures. If you are interested in this topic, this is a list of links. All the attacks I have been describing, uh, we wrote, my colleagues and I, we wrote uh, different papers. Uh, the first one is a paper about how to protect your software against uh, fall injection and side channels. Uh, I think it's very interesting. Yeah, so if you are interested, you can uh, read this. And finally, well, if you are interested, uh, we are hiring. We, are, uh, we have a security lab here in China, so if somebody of you is interested in this kind of hardware security evaluations, you can just join us. Okay, thank you. Thank you for listening. And if you have any question, please. I think there is a question here, a microphone. Sure, I'll mention. Ah, yeah. Hey, um, I'm just wondering, I mean, um, how practical is your uh, approach? Your, uh, to use the, I mean, it seems like uh, pretty uh, much it's Sorry, sorry, I, I, wait, I cannot listen because the audio is going in that direction and there is a lot of echo, so I cannot hear okay. the people down. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, how practical is your approach? It seems to me that uh, you're just using uh, brute force to try different points to see if there is any uh, possible problem, I mean, to, to uh, inject the, the glitch. So, sorry, again? Uh, how, pra uh, how practical is your approach? I mean, it seems to me that uh, you are uh, using a brute force in uh, approach to introduce the glitch into the board. Okay. And, yes. and the, the, uh, that's the, the states. Uh, yes. That's correct. So, uh, fall injection is not a science. Uh, when you inject a glitch, you don't have 100% uh, of possibilities of, in of succeeding. So, it's kind of brute forcing in the sense that you inject the glitch and you try, 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 try until you find uh, a glitch that flips the bits in the way you are looking for. So it's kind of brute forcing. So what we normally do is we, um, we have an idea of what we want to do. We see a code uh, that might be uh, potentially vulnerable to fall injection. We find which is the instruction we want to try to bypass. And then we try to inject glitches in this instruction and we try, 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 try. And we might have been trying for days, sometimes it's weeks, because we need to know exactly what is the glitch, the length, the shape of the glitch that um, affects exactly the, the, the chip in the way that we are looking for. So it's a kind of brute forcing until you find this, this perfect glitch. After you have this glitch, if you repeat the same glitch, you can uh, get, uh, well, uh, still you don't get 100% of uh, success rate, but I will be happy if I get a success rate of 100%, sorry, 1%. So after doing what we call a characterization campaign, where we're trying to find the perfect glitch that uh, affects the chip in the way we'll, we want, when we inject this glitch, I will be happy if we have a, yeah, w one glitch out of 100 uh, works and uh, break the, the, the product. But some devices are more sensitive than others. So for example, most of the small microcontrollers, you can get a success rate of 30%. So you can, one out of uh, three or four glitches, you can uh, bypass whatever you are trying to. But some other complex chips, like a small, sorry, like a big uh, processor, uh, like the ones that you have in a phone, it's much harder. You need to try much more. But yeah, it's you have to do a small brute forcing until you find the exact uh, glitch uh, that you need to, to do what you are looking for. So is there any other question? Uh, yes, I, I, I got a second question is that uh, uh, you just uh, described several. Okay, uh, sorry. You just described several sol uh, solutions to protect against this glitch attack. Uh, just uh, one is to use the hardware to use some redundancy bits and also to use some uh, software. But it seems to me that you just 
I mean, it's still the same as you are just trying to in, uh, introduce some uh, redundancy states. Yes. Uh, but since the state is already that big, the program state is already that big, you're just, you're just introducing two or three, uh, one or two or three bits of yes. redundancy. Yeah. And how much, I mean, how much safer would that make? Okay, uh, to be honest, uh, it's really impossible uh, to protect a product 100%. So when you add these controversies, you add redundancy, you add uh, uh, double checks, triple checks, what you are doing is protect your product in such a way that you reduce the chances of being glitch. But there is always a uh, possibility of being glitch. You cannot guarantee 100%. You can guarantee 99.9999%. There will be always a small chance to be uh, glitched. The thing is that you can protect your product in, uh, enough to demotivate the attacker. So the idea is not to protect your product so it's impossible to hack it, it's just that it's hard enough to demotivate the attacker so he will not try to attack your product. But yeah, it's, it's really impossible to, to get full assurance that you will never be hacked or glitched. So it's, it's like uh, it's never it's never possible to be 100% safe. I mean, it's it's never possible to be perfectly safe. Um, it's well, it's not. From the theoretical point of view, I think no. From the yeah, practical point of view, I think yes. Because if I need one year to hack something, I will not try, right? Uh, yes. I mean, if you are determined enough. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think there were more, more questions. Uh, two more questions there. How practical is a voltage attack? Have you actually got to remove the chip from the circuit board and able to get a decent spike? Or is there enough, how do you overcome the capacitance in, in the power lines to prevent you inserting a spike? Uh, sorry, again, you couldn't hear. You can. Do you have to remove the chip from the motherboard? Okay. I, I did not talk about the, practi the practical way to do the glitching. So, um, yeah, because I was talking that you inject a glitch by um, manipulating the power. So, how we manipulate the power? Okay, so uh, what we normally do, if we are going to manipulate uh, the power to do voltage glitching, what we normally do is just, we have uh, manipulate the PCB, only the circuit. We have to cut some traces in the circuit so we can, with our tool, uh, manipulate, uh, control the power. So voltage glitching is very easy. You only have to uh, solder some cables in the PCB. But when we do all this kind of uh, glitching, like a laser, when we use the laser, uh, laser is much more complicated. You have to decap the chip. You have to open the chip with a with a acid. You decap the chip, and then you can just attack uh, the chip. Um, there is some practical problems, but well, it's not really something that you cannot. Uh, work on. Um, I'm sorry, I think that the time is up, according to the screen, so maybe uh, we can continue with these questions uh, off topic, uh, sorry, uh, offline. Off so thank you again for, for listening, and uh, if you want to see one of these demos, please uh, ask me and I will just show you to you. Thanks.